Welcome everybody. We've got uh, a few more people to come in. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening for this online Avid Reader event, which is all about Sophie Laguna's extraordinary new novel, Infinite Splendors. My name is Jennifer Stevens. I am the book club's manager at Avid Reader. And it is my very real pleasure to be hosting this event tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm broadcasting to you. Here it is the Yagara and Turrbal peoples. I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm so pleased to be here with you tonight for this discussion of Infinite Splendours by Sophie Laguna, published by Alan and Unwin. Before I hand you over to our speakers this evening, I'd like to reiterate some of the information mentioned in the email you received earlier. You'll all be automatically placed, you've all been automatically placed on mute and will remain so throughout the event but I will invite everybody to unmute at the very end of the evening so that you can join me in thanking our speakers for tonight's discussion. Also, if you set your settings to speak of you, our guest speakers will take up the screen space. Sophie is keen to answer your questions in the latter part of the event. So please start sending your questions through as you think of them using the chat box. If you haven't seen it, then you will find the button that will open the chat box towards the bottom left of your screen. Your questions will come to me and I'll relay as many as we have time for in the Q&A period. I'd also like to mention that we have a special price on Infinite Splendors at Avid Reader and I'll be posting the link to purchase your copy of Infinite Splendors shortly. So now I'd like to introduce Sophie Laguna. Sophie Laguna's first novel for adults, One Foot Wrong, was published throughout Europe, the US and the UK, was long listed for the Miles Franklin Literary Award and shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Award. Her second novel for adults, the Eye, uh, the Eye of the Sheep, won the 2015 Miles Franklin Literary Award and was shortlisted for the Stella Prize and long listed for the International Dublin Impact Award. Sophie Laguna's third novel, The Choke, won the 2018 Indie Book Award for Fiction, as well as being shortlisted and longlisted for both national and international awards. Sophie's many books for young children, young people, have also been published in the US, the UK, and in translation throughout Europe and Asia. Her new novel is Infinite Splendors and is published by Alan and Unwin. In conversation with Sophie tonight is Caroline Baum. Caroline Baum has had a distinguished career in arts journalism and broadcasting, working for the BBC, ABC Radio and Television, Vogue magazine, and as founding editor of Good Reading magazine. In 2017, Caroline's work only, a singular memoir, was published with Alan and Unwin. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Caroline Baum and Sophie Laguna. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank and um, welcome everybody and welcome Sophie. Um, thank you for inviting me to host this conversation with one of my favorite Australian writers. I too would like to acknowledge the land on which I am. Um, I'm speaking with you this evening from New South Wales. I'm on Darawal country, the country of the Wadi Wadi people. And I would like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. I read Infinite Splendors just after reading Craig Sylvie's Honeybee and marveled at how both writers take male vulnerability and explore it with great tenderness. We've heard a lot recently about toxic masculinity, but I think that now we're seeing evidence of a fragile masculinity and Infinite Splendors really goes there. So the plot first up. Lawrence Lohman is a bright, caring boy with a gift for painting. He lives at home with his mother and his brother, his father having been killed in the war. When he's 10, his uncle Reggie arrives out of the blue and betrays Lawrence's trust in a way that has lasting consequences for him. 
But no matter what life throws at Lawrence as he becomes an adult, he finds solace and indeed a kind of state of almost transcendent ecstasy in the landscape and in painting. I thought this book was a book of remarkable imaginative empathy. Um, like Sophie's previous books, there are scenes in it that are so emotionally powerful that I had to put the book down, go for a short walk around the garden and do some breathing exercises before coming back to it. Sophie, you are one hell of a risk taker, but it really pays off for you and for us. So it's really fantastic to have this chance to talk to you about the book. Um, I thought maybe we should start right, right at the very obvious place, which is the title, Infinite Splendors. Can you tell us where that um, expression comes from? So Infinite Splendors comes from a letter that Jean Millet, the French artist, impressionist painter, wrote to um, his friend, his friend, uh, what's his name? Sensier, I think, in which he wrote that um, some who look what, what was the exact, what were the exact words? Um, something like some who look at the countryside see nothing but charm, but I see infinite splendors. And um, I was taken by that. And it just sort of played on my mind over the sort of 12 month period, you know, the first draft as a, as a possible title and it stayed. And um, Yes, I, I like the fact that um, it introduces the idea of the infinite mm. immediately, the, the infinite, because Lawrence is interested in the infinite and painting is, um, I think, an exploration of the infinite, isn't it? Because he describes it as a road, as pa each painting is like traveling along a road for which there is no destination. And he sees each painting as a kind of quest and um, he also understands painting as an attempt to um, capture or record or speak to the infinite. And he understands that everything he paints is temporary. So where did it come from and where is it going? And in his mind, there is there's something there about the mystery of the infinite so how perfect I thought and I love that it came from you know a real life not no longer with us but but Jean Millet yes yes um I wondered if it was if it was wrong of me to to, to take those words and I hope that it wasn't you know that that they were that they were Millet's first um but it felt more an homage if you like than then theft it felt, it felt right it felt right yeah i think it's i think it's a very yeah. good fit we'll come back to the painting in a moment but um at your launch last week you mentioned a couple of sparks that i thought were really interesting you mentioned that one spark uh, for this book was tom waits mm -hmm. and another was cormac mccarthy mm -hmm. and i was wondering were there any other sparks because i know for example that you watch movies was there anything that you got from any other media or were those the two kind of main propelling spark. I, I'm, tr I'm trying to think back because of course so much happened since those you know initial sparks the journey will be very rich from that point um, um, no it was it was those two ideas oh you know what's hung around over the over the decades Murakami's book the wind-up bird chronicles okay you know, where, where um, and this has been many years since I've read more th that book, but he goes down, doesn't he, doesn't he go down very deep and sits at the bottom of a tunnel underground? Was it a well that he climbed down? He sat underground for long periods of time. And Murakami was always, it was very um, mysterious about the character's purpose. But I, I was intrigued. I think that idea has hung around, the idea of a man who needs to go underground for periods of time, periods of recovery, periods of solace, um, perhaps because he's ashamed um, and needs time to be away from the demands of the ordinary world. So I think that was in there. I mean, you know, it's always um, an... A, 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 I have to really work to think of what the sparks are. You know, that's coming to me now in conversation with you because it's always a pretty, it's unconscious. It's a loose kind of a, 
a process. I mean, I can work now to, 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 to I can ask myself what it was, but what the experience was like at the time was just quite playful and loose. And I was just at the page. There was that song around in my head. Um, there was that, that novel by Cormac McCarthy, but um, I, I imagine the seeds for Lawrence were planted long ago. Mm. Um, you know, I, I imagine all these stories are sort of cooking away somewhere for many years. Yeah, I do like the cooking yeah. analogy because you can have something sort of simmering away on the back burner and it can just stay there for a seemingly yeah. indefinite period. It really of time can. While it gathers flavour. It's and amazing how long it can stay. <laughs> you know, it really can be there for years. Yeah, yeah. And it'll call you back or it won't. You also said on the night of the launch that um, that you, well, there were two really other interesting things that you said that I, I wanted to pick up on. One was that you often begin, or that you began this book with a monologue. And I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit about that monologue and that, um, whether you think that that does owe a lot to your kind of performing past and performing history. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it owes a lot to that past. It just, it's who I am. So that's what drove me, um, yeah, to, to studying acting in the first place. So, you know, some characters come very easily to, a, to you know, to you and, and others are really difficult and you'll search for them for, for weeks on the rehearsal floor. But some come immediately, you'll put on the right hat and spend a little bit of time in the voice and, and, and there the character is. And without you having to think too hard, you'll really surprise yourself with the stories that you can tell without having to, yeah, it's, it's a spontaneous, playful sort of a, a space. And um, it's nothing but fun. It's nothing but fun. It doesn't ask of you structure. It's a very loose, playful place. It's like impro improvisation. Mm -hmm. So in the very early stages of anything, the blank page can be quite an intimidating thing. You know, when, when one imagines, right, I've got to, I've got to do a hundred, I've got to make, I've got to write a hundred thousand words and, and find a beginning, middle and end. So that's way too difficult for anybody. So what about being in voice and talking and you get to know them? It's dramatic. It's interesting. It's relaxed. It's, it's really playful and it's really wide open. Having said that, um, the process of searching for a story begins, will begin at the very same time as that, as I, as I begin to write that monologue. Now, oh, there you are, Caro, you, you've gone, you've suddenly gone into the small frame, which is fine, which is fine, which is fine, there you are. So, um, yes, so, as I said, at the same time as beginning to write those words, I will also, in another part of my thinking mind, um, be beginning to looking looking for a seeking structure. So at the very same time as I, you know, talk about being playful and loose, I will rapidly go into, without even being conscious of it, what what how do I what, how am I going to build this thing? where's it going to go and beginning middle I'll be looking just completely instinctively for beginning middle and end because the other thing that was fascinating that you said that night was that you actually began this book with Lawrence as an adult and then yeah. you worked backwards to work out how yeah. was this adult made like this why is he the way he is so that process sounds really interesting exactly. can, you, can you tell us about that yeah so I began with a man who needs to go underground now, if you encounter a man in his 50s who needs to go underground, what happened? Why? And it's invariably the answers to that are going, if, it's, if, if a man needs to do something as extreme as go underground, there has to be something in the early years, in those very powerful, formative early years when we are at our most vulnerable, when we are new to the world, that must have happened, and I, um, I so I went went back there, and when I first met, if you like, Lawrence on the page, I didn't know um, I didn't know that I would love him the way that I grew to. So I I wasn't judging him, but I thought he was a different person. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as I came to know him as a child, our relationship or my knowing of him deepened greatly, and I couldn't help but 
um, I couldn't help but bond with him. I couldn't help but become protective of him. But yeah, if um, uh, and so so that's right. So so I began with him needing to go. I'm trying I'm trying to remember now how much I know. I remember I wrote forty six thousand words of him as a grown up because I remember going to my publisher and saying I don't know if this novel wants to happen, but I've written forty six thousand words of him as a in a as a monologue as a grown up. She said, it sounds like that. That's quite a lot, Sophie. That, that's a lot of words. I said, do you reckon? She said, I remember we were having coffee in Sydney. And uh, she said, it does. It's a lot. And that, 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 that was very uh, encouraging. You know, as I think, gosh, okay, maybe this novel wants to live. And um, probably maybe you have a sort of natural length, because now that I think about it, your books are mostly the same size. And you said 100,000 words. But I've always been told yeah. that 40,000 is the point of no return. So you had passed the point of no return. Oh, God, I wish I'd known that. That was so <laughs> interesting. No, but guess what? This one's actually a bit longer. Each time I've noticed I've gone, I've gone even 10 or 15,000 words longer each book. And so I'm going to reverse that is my, no, I'm not going to talk about what I'm going to do next because who knows. But um, yeah, so that's right, 46,000 words. And then I must have, um, and I, I had, Caro, I had all these ideas that I wanted to be very tricky. And should I, ought I to write the novel in flashback? Because that's what clever people do. <laughs> and um, it just didn't seem to want to happen that way. Why? Why? For the sake of what? Um, and so, isn't it, you know, I really should um, keep on hand a, a journal where I can see exactly how I made this thing. I, I, I know I did the 46,000 and then I must have gone to Lawrence as a 10 year old. And um, I thought I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to live the moment where he discovers painting for the first time. Um, I'll have to, yeah. You know, one has to make decisions about what moments one assumes the character already has behind him and which ones will I discover for the first time. And it's a lot harder work to live the moment for the first time. So I put, I, I ask it of myself. You know what I mean? I ask it of myself. Really, what's it like the first time? Yeah. And you mentioned there, you know, the thing of no judgment, and that's one of the kind of hallmarks really of, of your work is that you are able to give us often very dark and disturbing, compl complicated, complex characters mm. without passing judgment on them. But one of the things that's a sort of central theme or preoccupation of your work, I think, is the breaching of boundaries between children and adults. And I was just wondering whether you could explore that mm. a little bit for us now. Yeah, I like the way you put that, Caro, the breaching of boundaries. I am interested in that between children and adults and adults and adults and um, because um, this is where the damage comes from. Mm. This is where the damage comes from. Boundaries not being understood or seen or um, and uh, th that must be what I'm interested in either repairing by addressing it in my fiction or I mean, I don't go into, as you, you know this probably about my work, I don't um, go into it with any over, with any, is the word, rationale. You know, I, I don't go in there consciously to change, to, to, with a message. I don't go in with a message. I just, I go on a journey with, with the character. And, of course, any story becomes inherently moral, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. A story just without you even trying becomes but it's story first and character first and and I've, I've described to you know the way the journey begins um I, I I didn't know it would become this story you know the the Tom Waits song and the idea of um a man who buries himself I, I did that doesn't sound very empathetic does it that doesn't sound like the transcendent ecstasy that you described when you introduced the book, which I love the way you did that, Caro. Um, and I haven't heard those words yet put together to describe his sometimes experience. I was grateful to hear it. Um, so yeah, my initial idea didn't, didn't hold that empathy. Um, but then as the journey began, and then, you know, yeah, my connection with him deepens. So yeah, boundaries. Um, mm. 
I mean, you know, the, there's the writer Sophie, there's Sophie at write, writing in the book is a very different person to me outside of the book, living ordinary life. So it's difficult. It's difficult to speak from to speak from writer Sophie because she just um, is doing this thing um, with, without it, a lot of it's unconscious and mysterious. So yeah. I have to try and find words for what she's doing. It's hard because <laughs> me in ordinary life, what's that, Caro? Like a kind of magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, magic. I don't want to make it sound highfalutin or or anything. It's just. Um, I wasn't, you know, could I ask, was I conscious of the fact that I was going to write a book about the price one pays when certain boundaries are crossed? Am I, am I going in there to, sh I suppose I am on a level. Mm -hmm. I do want to show, I do want to show how damaging that kind of an invasion is how profoundly damaging and also how redemptive art, artistic expression can be, and also how brilliant we are, you know, how, how, how much we have to offer and how, how, um, so how even though broken in places, how still open to, to life and, and light we are. And he... You know, this character, Lawrence, was broken in a way that, in the worst way, yeah. I, I think I believe, in the worst way. And yet he spent his life uh, learning light. That's what he spent his life doing, recording it, depicting it, learning about it, sharing it, describing it, rejoicing in it. I mean, what does that tell us about what it is to be human? that we really are capable of miracles and the miraculous at the very same time as we can hurt each other in ways that how do you get your head around how we can do that to another person? How, how do you, I mean, I don't even, look, I, um, you know, the, the, the damage is done at the hands of, um, of, a, of an adult. You know, Lawrence suffers at the hands of an adult. And it's important to understand how that adult can act in that way. It's amongst us. It's among us. It's um, commonplace. I don't know if commonplace. It, it, it happens. Mm. It happens a lot. So if it happens a lot, it's better that we don't make it so out there, not us, that we never go close to it. It happens. I, uh, I'm not an expert in. I'm not an expert. I just, I just lived in it. That's what. An, that's what. An, that's what a writer of fiction. That's their expertise, isn't it? They dwell in it. They take a risk and they just swim in it and inhabit it for many, many, many months, longer than most people. You know, the book. How long does it take to read? A lot less time than it takes the author to create. So that's. What the work that the that's what the work of a creative of a fiction writer is they they are in that universe in those shoes so I did go there mm -hmm. and he was profoundly damaged the perpetrator and yeah. and um, I wasn't aware isn't this interesting I'm I'm horribly outraged by everything and everyone and I'm really you know so you know how, like it's people when they describe my writing say you know never judges and I don't but that's not me in real life. You know, me in real life is, you know, all sorts of very ordinary, judgmental sort of things, you know. Um, but thank when God I'm, Thank God for that. Otherwise, yeah. you'd be a saint. I'd be boring. But when I'm writing him, for example, so when I'm writing him, I'm not horrified by him at the time of I'm writing him. I'm too, I'm too engaged in what his struggle is. It's, it's, it's a hard one to describe. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you something let's just let's just go to um um the incident the episode itself um around th this this brokenness this betrayal of trust um yeah. well, it's, I, drawn out, isn't it? it's a process it's a process because it happens over a period of weeks it does and yeah. and as is often the case in reality yeah. it is yeah. a member of the family you know yeah. it is the person closest to you so it is this newly appearing uncle reggie when both boys when both lawrence and paul really need a father yeah 
you know, one arrives out of the blue. And so, you know, one of them has one response and the other has the other response. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that Uncle Reggie comes into Lawrence's life when Lawrence is 10. And in the book, um, later on, the feelings that Lawrence has about other children, boys um, around him, uh, again and again, it's 10 years old. They're all 10 years old, the ones that he feels this great kind of attraction and feeling for. What is it about the age of 10, do you think? In me or in him? You answer that, which well, well, in him, in him, it, it, that, that was the age when you know that critical age where he was wounded, mm. and so a part of him is stuck there, and he's seeking to um, repeat, reenact it, understand it. We, we, all of us, all of us, reenact our dramas until we become conscious mm. of them, and we're at the mercy of them unconscious we unconsciously draw to ourselves the same so, so, the same people or the same opportunities and we reenact it like like we're butting up against it blindly drawn to it i mean um you know psychiatry has known that this is what we do i mean we've known this for 100 years it's you can see it in your own life and you can see it in the lives of those around you and you, you know, look, it's so, we're so blind because it's uh, um, the wound is unconscious until until it's sort of drawn up and out, like um, yeah, and 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 so uh, you know it's mysterious. Also, he is seeking a part of it himself that was lost, and it's mixed up, isn't it, with sort of latent sexual feelings? It's all mixed up. It's all untidy and broken and in there also is a knowing that he mustn't and 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 at the very same time an unconscious compulsion mm. not an unconscious compulsion a compulsion um and he rides between the two between the two and he makes some very bold choice you know he decides he will withdraw the world is that the world beyond the Grampians where the story is set is not the world for him and he will be on the mountain and he will be in the bunker and he and he will be and he will go between them with his tray of colors and I like that so his tray of colors his paints will help him to to, to describe this this world in which he's suspended between the two yeah, and as you say, I mean, it's a wonderful image that you've just painted between that sort of yeah. the, the elevation yeah. and sort of um, yeah. kind of thin aired elation, yeah. the mountaintop, and then that sort of burrowing yeah. animal of being underground, which is so primal. Yeah. Um, can I just ask you, you know, for me, the most powerful and moving and, and in many ways distressing, but also um, very tender, um, depiction in the book is the relationship between Lawrence and Paul. Mm. Mm. And when Lawrence is this isolated, stuttering mm. adult, um, his brother brings food and, and delivers things mm. to him and mm. paints. And um, the relationship is very uncomfortable mm. and hostile and full of tension. Can you talk about how you created that dynamic? Because it's such an interesting part of the book. Well, there's a great deal of ambivalence, isn't there, but, you know, from Lawrence. He hates him and as soon as he's gone, he misses his laughter and finds himself listening for the sound of his engine on the road again. Mm. Um, well, this is siblings, isn't it? A lot of siblings. It's, it's love-hate. Um, he envies his younger brother. He sees his younger brother able to marry and move about in the world and work and socialise. He hates him. Of course he does. Mm. Pissed off. Mm. His brother, he protected his brother as a child and he'd do so again. This is siblings. He would do so again in a heartbeat. Um, uh, you know, Paul wasn't, Paul didn't lose so much of himself when uncle came. He wasn't vulnerable to uncle because he didn't have Lawrence's same imagination, openness, 
Uncle only chose Lawrence. Uncle only chose Lawrence. Mm. And Uncle gave uh, Lawrence gifts along the way. That's what's complex about that arrangement. That's yeah. what's layered and difficult about it. Um, yeah, he loves Lawrence. And Lawrence, if it weren't for, La if it weren't for Paul, you know, how would uh, uh, Lawrence function? I, I don't know. I think he's a good brother. I think Paul is a good brother. Um, as far as how I did it, um, I just I enjoyed their relationship. Um, I know what brothers are like. I mean, I know what siblings are like, <laughs> and I, uh, I I know how rough and tumble it is, how raw and and wild young sibling relationships are. They're not neat and tidy, you know. And it was interesting listening to Kate Evans. I didn't listen to her whole. Um, review or breakdown of Infinite Splendours, but she spoke about the book reminding her at points of um, Roddy Doyle's Paddy Clark, ha, 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 and I've read it recently. And I have never read a better, I've never read a more powerful description of, of boyhood on the streets, of, of siblings, of friendship, young male friendship. How wild! It, how wild! There's always that element of Lord of the Flies, not as not as extreme. And I wish I could find a more elegant way of putting it, because there's much more love than that. But it's a wild place, and it's not it's not tamed yet. It's raw. Um, but they that they were really connected as as siblings. They were particularly connected. Maybe growing up without a father, maybe living in the country in that way. Maybe their very devoted mother. They were good boys. They were devoted to each other. They were good brothers and they were good boys. They were responsible boys, really. They were well they were well raised for one of the, you know, they were they benefited from Louise's commitment to their education, their well-being, their beautiful environment. Mm. Um, and you know, the first time they climbed the mountain together, Lawrence, they stand at the view holding hands. And Lawrence has the sense, you know, he, he has a moment then, doesn't he, of transcendent ecstasy. His first, his first taste of transcendent ecstasy. And at the time, Paul is holding his hand. And he says, from that vantage point, the whole world stretched before him and he imagines all the adventures to come and that it was Paul's hand that would enable them. The faraway world and the close, the warmth, the contained, the human connection that would give him that um, the foundations to become great, to explore. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I knew all along how that was going to be compromised. Um, mm, that's heartbreaking. Let's talk about yeah. that mountain, Sophie, because we're there with you right now. Yeah. Um, the landscape of the Grampians, you've, you've given us this mountain, this sort of monumental um, <clears throat> place that that has almost sort of um living breathing qualities and you call it wallace mm. which i gather is not the name of the real place so no. why did you choosing to set it in the grampians not just stick with the real name of the real mountain do you think i ought to have no i don't know <laughs> well 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 there must have been a reason why i didn't um we, when you fictionalize something it gives you a little bit more room to move and you can make it truly make it your own. And you don't have to, if you need your mountain to kind of vertically jut left while your house sits, you have permission to do so. It's a better, it's a better, you don't have to stick to the to to exactly how it is in real life. And you can own it, probably. Um, and I, so, so, okay, this is how it will work for me, you know. So I don't make big decisions about these things. I'll just be writing. I won't yet know exactly what all the mountains are called. So Wallace will arrive on the page um, and I think, oh, that's, that's, there's a funny sort of, that appeals. It's hard to find words for why the name Wallace appeals. Sort of a rat, the sound is kind of round and warm and sturdy. Perhaps English sounding name, Wallace um and you bond with it and before you know it, you're developing a character called Wallace and you know within six weeks he can't be anything else it doesn't matter what the other mountains are called yours is Wallace <laughs> and and um he looks over the boy and he bears witness mm. to, to everything mm. to the beauty and the horror 
but in the end, Lawrence feels betrayed, I think. But, but, but for many years in the novel, um, Wallace is a symbol of something very positive, isn't he? Very positive. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. While we're talking about places, um, there's a, a lovely thing in Lawrence's childhood, which is the reading at school of yeah. Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. And I was just wondering about why that story is an important anchor in Lawrence's life. Well, again, so, you know, I, as I'm, as I'm, you know, discovering Lawrence's childhood, I know I wanted to give him a teacher with some imaginative flair, Mrs. St. Clair. Mm. And um, she, she was a little eccentric and very kind and very encouraging. And she saw something in Lawrence. And the school text that year was Robinson Crusoe. But I don't, I don't scan the library shelves what will be the right one. I it's I haven't I just sit at the at the table and Robinson Crusoe arrives on the page. And so so then that idea feels right. And so I'll repeat it and then I'll read, read it, and then I'll um, look at quotes from it and then I'll read about it. Oh, that feels good. A man that was shipwrecked and, and the profound things that he learned about his thoughts and about the power of the mind. And it, if it lends itself in the right way, it will begin to grow as a motif. And that's what happened with Robinson Crusoe. And so then he bonds and right, he was reading it in that year that his uncle came, mm -hmm. just before he came. And Robinson Crusoe represented something really exciting and positive and a shared reading experience and one that was very stimulating, expansive, um, about language and words and character. She just loved it. She used to ride home every afternoon she'd read it with the sweat dripping down her face. I think she was menopausal. <laughs> Heat waves, tears, every child cross-legged, glued to these words, these beautiful words. And he would ride home standing up on his pedals and shout out to the mountain, Crusoe. And so, you know, Crusoe became, you know, he's a very imaginative boy. And Crusoe mixed in then with the, this powerful mountain figure and this imaginative life that he was living and painting. And the world was wide open. That book, Crusoe was only the beginning. It wasn't that the book, you know, had some significance greater than far greater than Shakespeare was going to have, or it was just learning, wonderful learning, mm. and he was right for it. And um, I suppose I'm showing that I'm showing that in his response to that text. And it's a powerful choice as well, because of course Crusoe is isolated, Lawrence is isolated, so it's about a yeah. survivor in isolation. So it has a resonance. <laughs> But see, I never know any of those things when I'm doing it. <laughs> no, I really don't. No, I mean that I, you know, I'm told afterwards. So <laughs> it's good. It's, yeah. only, it's not conscious. It's not conscious. What about um, the music that uh, Lawrence listens to as an adult? Yeah. He's chosen Madame Butterfly, which yeah. is one of the most achingly beautiful pieces of music about love and yeah. love and sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, don't tell me that that's completely unconscious and just came to you out of the blue as well. Well, it, it, I wouldn't use that phrase out of the blue. It's not out of the blue doesn't, doesn't describe it, nor does it unconscious describe it. I'm at the page and it, I'm writing about him and yeah, it, Madam Butterfly. <laughs> I don't, um, I don't go to the, where's, where's um, every opera that's been written in the past hundred years. I, 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 like everybody else, have picked up along the road of my life bits of Madame Butterfly and, and bits of various other uh, operas. I know that it is a story of, of great, uh, I, I know it's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. I know some of the music's very beautiful. I love the name Madame Butterfly. I love that it will, if I choose, so if I'm going to um, analyse it all, if I choose the name Madame Butterfly, it's feminine, it's lyrical, it's colourful, butterflies are beautiful. So <laughs> Madame, so there's no accident, I'm choosing those two words, Madame Butterfly. And all the small things I've learned in the course of my lifetime about Madame Butterfly, not because I'm an expert. So then 
now hear me at this age, at this point, sitting down in front of my table, Madam Butterfly appears. No surprise. No surprise why it would. Not to me. And then, and then as I begin to read translations, I just it works perfectly. Mm. And I bond with it as an idea. But I might, at different points in the story, choose ideas that don't stick around and they'll only stick around for a little while. And then they'll like, they're like trails that don't lead, they don't bear fruit. So I'll pull back and by, you know, by a draft in, I'll know what my set of symbols, um, or what my motifs are. So there's, yeah, they're, like, they're, they're not endless. There's a lot in this book. There's a, there's a lot in this book because there's all the letters between the artists. Mm -hmm. There's the paintings, there's the mountain. I'll feel instinctively how, you know, when enough is enough and how much I can afford. Um, and uh, Madame Butterfly came pretty early. What was that film? There was a film that played a part in here that William Hurt was in, in the prison. Remember a million years ago when he was in, when he was in a prison and he would, I, he would dress as a woman in prison oh, really? yes oh my god oh well, someone will know anyway. anyway doesn't matter I, I was aware of that you character there know. if you do know pop it in the chat so that we can find out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, um, so kiss of the spider woman kiss of the spider woman yes that was floating around in there somewhere okay. um so so and then when i read the translation there were so many phrases that worked so beautifully. And I loved introducing another language into the story. Another resonance in the book, and this is a particularly powerful one, um, begins with the epigraph that you've chosen, which is a line from the letters of Vincent van Gogh. Yeah. The lamps are burning and the yeah. starry sky yeah. is over it all. And yeah. of course, um, Paul and Lawrence are brothers. Yeah. Lawrence is this um, possessed sometimes painter so how important was that spirit of Van Gogh hovering over this story? Isn't that lovely? I do think this, he was. I do feel you described it perfectly. See, other people are much better. You can see that his spirit is hovering. And now that you describe it, yeah, I think he was. I didn't want to, he's been so, um, he's iconic and he's been over, you know, there's been so many songs and so much mythology around him so I didn't want to um I didn't want to draw from that source too heavily I wanted the, the quote at the front as a kind of um is it is the word uh is it a homage or a tribute or an acknowledgement um there were many to choose from because he's he wrote extensively so I wanted to choose a, a piece a sentence that was soft that said very little, but in its simplicity said a great deal. Mm. It's so beautiful, isn't it? I think you're, that, that's one of the things about the way you write, Sophie, that I kind of marvel at is the way you manage to sort of um, take all these references and not overstate. So everything is there, but it's there in a very light sort of shimmering way. It doesn't weigh the narrative down. And I think I was aware that that was a risk, you know, and I'm getting better as the years go by of doing less, of doing less. There's so much less that a writer has to do. What do you mean? You can try striking every second sentence and leave some space. You can try striking the last third of so many sentences. There's so much a writer doesn't need to have there. The work is let the reader do it. You only need to, the writer just provides the springboard, the reader springs. Springboard, the reader springs. That's what your job is to touch and then they fill. That's, our, that's what I think is the work. Don't do the second half. Don't repeat your dialogue. I mean, there's all sorts of technical things I've, le I've learned. Just, it's, um, it's about, I, I've, I mean, it's about listening to the writing. Mm -hmm. You can feel, it's almost like the letters are there invisibly when you strike them anyway, and the reader can read them, but they're invisible. That's a clumsy way to put it. If your scaffolding is strong, the reader will do the rest. Mm. And if you do both, you're just gonna kill it. 
and shrink it, shrink the experience because mm. there's no room then for ambivalence, for nuance, for, for magic. You just do, you just, just do the, you know, I'm struggling here because I'm just trying to find words for that, which is, which is just, you can't really ever pin it down, but I'm doing my best to find words for what it's like. The process. It's interesting to hear you say that because yeah. I wouldn't really describe you as a minimalist writer. So when you say do less, you know, I don't feel yeah. I feel like there's a lot of room for the reader to fill. You're absolutely right. But it's yeah. not it's not a spare kind of writing style that you have at all. So no. that's really interesting. But I feel like you've just given some of the writers who are watching tonight because I'm yeah. sure you can see some writers in yeah. the room with us tonight. Oh, just try it. Try it. Every second sentence can go. It's amazing. Even, I, every, I think Helen Garner said to try that. Yeah, I think I feel like you've given us a kind of a, a mini masterclass here on a, on a Monday. Oh, I hope that's valuable. I'll probably never be able to do it again. I'm who knows? Who knows? Yeah, okay. we've we've come to the end of our very brief time together and I'm going to throw back to Jennifer who's going to um, talk to us about questions field questions from the audience and I may come back in a moment. But anyway, that went very quickly, didn't it, Caro? It flew past. It flew. It just flew. Jennifer. Thank you, thank you Caroline. <clears throat> and thank you, Sophie. Uh, it's been um, absolutely wonderful hearing hearing this conversation this evening. Sophie, um, one of the things I loved about Infinite Splendors was the way um, the way Lawrence's artistic expression developed through the book. And as you put it, you know, he spent his life learning light. Mm. And I wondered, was it was it very early on that you came to visual art as his way to discover light you know, rather than another form of artistic expression? I mean, do you paint yourself? Or what was it that drew you to, to painting and art as, as, as the way for Lawrence to have beauty in his life? I think I made the decision, I'm thinking back, I think I made the decision very early on and it was sparked by the, a collection of letters that I have between artists, um, painters that have left us many, many years ago. Um, was, it those, was it my collection of those letters? It, it's very difficult to remember exactly at what point, you know, the creative, you know, the way a novel grows is organic, for, for want of a better word. So at the same time as having a character who needed to go underground, I would have been deciding that it would be painting. And then I might have thought, and he could have, we could, I could use those letters. He could have a book of those letters and it could be could be the uncle that, that gave him that book. And then I would read the letters and then I learned all the wonderful things that John Constable said about um, that it was, you know what he said, Jennifer, it was so useful. He said it was the scenes, everything he saw before he was 10 years old that taught him to be a painter. And he said, if he never saw the River Stour, I can't pronounce it again, he could, he would paint it forever. Mm -hmm. And he said it was, it was his, it was the days of his carefree childhood, his boyhood, that had given every, him everything. He was a painter, he said, years before he put a pencil in his hand. Okay. Now, th things when I read things like that, I was just oh, I couldn't believe how beautiful and um, helpful to, mm -hmm. to, to, to this story. That I mean, that's probably all the great artists of this world, mm -hmm. isn't it? Amazing. Yeah. And he and he used that age, ten years old. Mm -hmm. And then I read in the letters how um, he said the sky has to be incidental. It can't. It can't. We can't know that we're being directed by the sky by the light in the sky, but it's the light in the sky that is um, dictating, that is telling us what the painting is and means and everything else. Yeah, uh, it all just sort of happened. It all just sort of happened. That, that's not a very good way to answer. That's a lovely answer, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Sophie, Stephanie has asked, as an adult, how are you able to write the voices of your child protagonists? What is your process or approach to accessing, accessing children's voices, thought processes and feelings so vividly and credibly? And she says, it is your superpower. Well, um, it's a funny, yeah. 
I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not a ma- I'm not male either. Look, it's my belief that we can all um, access myriad voices that we've all been children and most of us for great sections of us are still children don't you think i mean you see how often it's very hard to grow up Mm, it's like we are it's very hard to be integrated and grow up we all become children all of the damn time to our own detriment i mean look at politics in america yeah I mean, look all over the look all over the place. It's hard to grow up, and, and our voices might become our ways might become more civilized and mannered, and we might become more clever. But we all you, you all, we all know how much of us is regressed so much of the time. It's hard work growing up, and on some level, yeah. So, but I'm not sure that that answers the question. Uh, yeah, I, I think we have been children and we are, there are children's voices inside us and there are middle-aged voices inside us. How else then would you account for actors who can play characters far older than themselves beautifully? Mm. Imagination. Mm. It's enjoyment. If you enjoy playing, if you enjoy inhabiting a voice who's five, if it thrills you, you're going to, be in it and immerse yourself in it and be playful in it. Look, a close family member once said to me, Sophie, you are so five. (laughs) (laughs) So, but really, I mean, you can be teenager too. Think of your husband (laughs) or your your dad or, you know how they can be at times. It's about um, dressing up in a way and and being playful and enjoying it enjoying it um i think it it must um express something for me sophie um verity has commented on how gorgeous the um the cover yeah i know i couldn't believe it and uh she's asked if you had an influence on the design and and none whatsoever None whatsoever, but I, I had the sense, it was as if the designer, Sandy Cull, had spoken, you know, had, had, had really um, seen my dreams or something because of the colour. You mm. know that my very first book published in 2002 was called My Yellow Blankie. <laughs> and that's what yellow is. Yellow is so warm and wattle is so... Well, they're not wattle. Are they wattle flowers, do you think? They're so beautiful. Mm. And yep. it, she must have, you know, you know, Sandy Cull, the designer, must have, she didn't speak to my dreams. She read the story. Mm. That's, what, that's all she needed to do. Yeah. And, and I suppose it was important, um, you know, from, from, you know, in, in order for the book to reach as many readers as possible to, to give it a cover which emphasised its, um, its, its beauty. Mm. Yeah, because interesting, you know, when I think of the book, you know, when, you know, some re- readers are, are at different points distressed by, the, by some of the book, when I think of the book personally, I, I'm, I, I, think more of the light and the life and the growth in the book. Um, Yeah. That actually leads into a question from Jackie. Yeah. She asks if you need to have um, a recovery process from from writing. No, no, I I don't need a recovery process from writing. Um, I mean, really, the bulk of the book was done really quite a long time ago I mean I was still doing the very final edits in the lockdown but really the whole body the body was there um writing it doesn't exhaust me in any way at all I can be distracted from writing because of the demands of ordinary life but it won't be you know it it won't be the, the writing itself but that doesn't tire me. Other things do. Uh, other things do greatly. So other stresses do. But writing is a way of um, containing those stresses and bringing me um, security. Mm-hmm. 
And I've, I've got a question from Bianca. She wonders if, if you could offer any advice for writers on, on crafting characters that readers can relate to and empathize with. And she wonders if you um, use exercises to get into character and motivation. Um, well, it, 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 I mean, I'm sure, I know that there are plenty of writing exercises um, that help writers find characters. For me, it's intuitive. So I'll, I'll know the essence of a character intuitively and I'll make decisions about that character and then feel if they fit. What is the character's workplace? If the character's workplace, how empowered is the character in their workplace? That's going to change how they operate in the world. Does it feel wrong or does it feel right? The reason, yes, yeah, so so for me personally, it, it feels, um, it, it's intuitive. It, it's intuitive. Um, yeah, so, so there's no specific exercise. My knowing of the character will build layer by layer. So I described for you how, you know, the first seeds for Lawrence and I didn't, I didn't really know him. And then as the weeks go by, and as I say, develop the way he paints. And as I come to understand his childhood, I come to know him better and better. But again, a lot of it, you know, I don't sort of think consciously, um, I'll, I'll have, there'll be, there'll be sort of um, shadows of people that I've known either um, personally or in the media or who might influence him. He's a composite, I suppose. Um, it's more a feeling. So I don't know how helpful that is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of our evening. So um, Caroline, did you have any any final final comments that you'd like? So many things that I'd still like to ask you about. Um, and you know, well, impossible to choose. But um, you said at the um, at the launch that um, when when you've done with a book, your characters leave you behind. So you're not still living with the characters from the eye of the sheep in your head and the characters from the choke. And so I guess it's still probably um, too fresh while you're in the zone of talking about the book. Yeah. That yeah. Lawrence and Paul and Reggie are in your head, but have new characters started to kind of speak to you already? Yeah, I mean, I was writing other books while I was writing this one, actually, between, you know, when I didn't have it when it because because you know it sits with the editor for a long time sometimes mm. and what are you going to do um you know I do a lot of housework but you know <laughs> uh, um I'm pretty I suppose I'll say to myself Sophie you have to get this you know I'll give myself word counts and I have to write that day and I'm pretty strict about that um um so yeah, it's a bit of a raw time, right? And you know, raw is not the right word, Caro, but, you know, it's a bit of a difficult time because the book is just coming out now, it's just coming out. And so I was in a really protected bubble world with him and it was so good to be there with him. It was a happy being with him in that creative world, you know, and I would go to the Grampians, climb the Grampians, look at paintings, just be in that transcendent, moments of transcendent ecstasy. Um, I knew him as a boy. It was a safe, busy, structured world, particularly once you're behind your first draft, once you've got your first draft done, and then the play, the great puzzle of words, the great play of switching sentences this way and that. It's fun. It's mm -hmm. not a great word. It's, it's, it's what's the word? Is it, satisfying meaningful work um now this stage this is this is really different this is hard i mean i'm grateful it's necessary it's the next stage but it's different mm, you're and, positioning out of one world and out of one yeah. set of stories and characters and oh. and also letting go of them and giving them to yeah, us that's it and hearing other people's take you know other people's understanding and getting asked about it it's difficult and being worried being worried will it be all right and what will people say and yeah it's not it's it's harder 
it's harder i mean there are you know it's, it's lovely as well and you know i do miss like i i've enjoyed this conversation immensely but it's hard because when one is in the room with people i can feel that warmth and it's reassuring and it's heartwarming and it's a bit spooky because i'm just here and i can't feel yeah. anybody so you're hoping that you're giving what needs to be given but when i'm in a room with people we're giving to each other and it's really safe. It's still safer mm. and warmer. And so when things are a bit difficult, I'll give myself a hard time, you know, about how did it go and how is it going? When I'm just writing Lawrence, it's not like that. It's a safe. Mm. So it's, it's, it's testing in that way. So it's more to manage. Does that make sense? It does. And Sophie, I, I want to, um, I guess, give you back some of the love that I'm seeing coming in here. Oh, you don't have to. It's okay. I'll be all right. People are, uh, people are making comments about how captivating they found this conversation. I hope so. How interesting and enjoyable it has been to listen to you and um, how much they're looking forward to reading the book. It is, it is wonderful. I have, I have read this, this novel myself and, and I, the beauty and, in this novel is quite extraordinary. Thank you. Um, thank you. And so I want to thank Caroline, I want to thank you, Sophie, everyone here for being here. I'm going to ask you all to unmute and and please, um, please, please come, anyone who would like to, please join me in thanking Sophie and thanking Caroline. It'd be lovely to have you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for thank your you. attention. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Caro. Thank you for your questions. Jennifer, thank you so much for being such a good organiser and host. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. It's been a real delight to be part of this this evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank Thanks you so much. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.